The following production is part of the We Be Geeks Podcast Collective. From days long ago, from uncharted regions of the universe, comes a legend. A dream that came through a million years, that lived on through all the tears. It came here, the Fandom Nexus. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to our host as he plugged in his microphone. I have a podcast! Here he is, your spider pan, Jeremy. Hello, hello, it is I, it is your spider pan, Jeremy, and we are back again for another adventure here in Neverland inside the fandom Nexus. We've got a lot of fun planned for today. We're going to talk to Gary Goddard. He's got a long list of things on his resume, including being the director of the 1987 Masters of the Universe film with Dolph Lundgren. He has been a Disney Imagineer. He went to Cal Arts. He's worked in the Disney uh, or the Universal theme parks, creating rides, lots of things on his resume. We're going to talk to him later. Got a great conversation with him. But before we get to that, I do want to visit the trailer park. We have a lot of new trailers. In fact, there was one trailer that we've been waiting for that I wasn't expecting. And I don't think that they meant to have released, but somebody leaked it. And so they released something. <laughs> So we've got stuff in the trailer park. We've got a little bit of news to discuss, and I really just probably should get straight to it. So uh, instead of me just sitting around here talking about it, you know, normally, of course, we'd go through and we would talk about what I've been watching this week. But, you know, I'm going to mention later what part of what I've been watching this week, you know, what I've been playing and that sort of thing. But really, we just need to dive into some stuff. So here we go. the Disney and Geek Universe to bring you the best in comics, toys, movies, and entertainment. This is news from around Neverland. All right. The only piece of news I really want to get into is there was announced this week the new Genie Plus app with the Disney parks. And this caused quite a stir. And let me just read some of the features uh, listed over here in the Disneyland.disney.go.com. And this apparently does go for both parks, but it says you can get an itinerary updates from morning to night. Disney Genie will continue to update your itinerary throughout the day so you can be more spontaneous and go with the flow. Find your favorites at a glance. Create your very own personal tip board to instantly see your favorites. It will display current and forecasted future wait times, helping you predict when you might experience quicker entry to attractions. Enjoy more flexibility and fun. Disney Genie brings existing planning features together in one place. Join a virtual queue at certain attractions, making dining and experience reservations, mobile order food at many locations, get help with the virtual assistant, and more. Now, yeah, within the last few years, mainly since COVID, you know, the annual pass holder programs kind of been shut down in at least Disneyland. I don't know if Walt Disney World still has anything like that. And you, we've seen sort of the end of fast passes. So there's Disney or Genie Plus service, and these are like two other options there to, to enjoy the theme park along with the. Uh, I mean, really, the Genie. It looks like it's something they're adding to the current uh, resort app that you have already that you can download. I don't believe the 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 regular one actually costs you anything, but now. Now, this will cost you something for Disney Genie Plus service. For the price of $15 per day per ticket at Walt Disney World Resort and $20 per day per ticket at Disneyland Resort. Why does it cost more at Disneyland? I don't know. Uh, choose the next available time to arrive at a variety of attractions and experience using the Lightning Lane entrance. It's basically fast pass. You make one selection at a time throughout the day from classics like Haunted Mansion to thrill rides like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and newer favorites like Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, attractions subject to limited availability. This convenient option is the next evolution of the fan-favorite Disney Max Pass service from Disneyland Resort. 
Disney Genie Plus will also include Disney Parks themed audio experiences and photo features to capture your memories. Unlimited Disney Photo Pass downloads from your day if you are visiting Disneyland Resort. Let me go ahead and read the next thing. Individual attraction selections available for purchase. Schedule a time to arrive at up to two highly demanded attractions each day using the Lightning Lane entrance, like Radiator Springs Racers at Disney California Adventure Park. Subject to the limit of availability, attractions not included with the Disney Genie Plus. Pricing for this option will vary by date, attraction, and park, and will be announced closer to launch. So, how you used to be able to just get a fast pass for an attraction. I remember when I was there, 2009, at Walt Disney World, we could go to an attraction, and if we saw the line was pretty long, we thought, we might want to skip that. Let's see if a fast pass is available. We would just hit a kiosk, and it would print ticket. We could pick a time. It would print us up these little tickets for that time, and we would come back at that time. And it didn't cost you anything extra. You just had to put in your park ticket. Now, for Disney Plus or Genie Plus service, $15 per day per ticket, you can pick your rides, which is a service you used to not have to pay for there either. You used to be able, you know, with your magic band, you could go through and kind of set things up and you could pick, but I think you were limited for the amount of rides you could get a fast pass for, which was fine. I mean, really, you would be somewhat limited if you're even at the park before because you might not have a fast pass available at a particular ride or attraction. Now they want to have you pay an extra fee. And this on the heels, uh, they just had, just what, a couple of weeks ago, there was some other service that they were going to be charging you for. Uh, and people weren't really that happy about that either. And uh, even on the Disney Parks blog, you look in the comments, and there are really a lot of people complaining uh, here's, here, let me just read some of these. It says, it's not so much the cost that concerns me. Really, after spending thousands of dollars on resort rooms, park tickets, food, merchandise, and transportation, getting there is a $15 a day really that much of a problem? What bothers me now, instead of planning my fast passes before time and having everything set, I have to make sure that I'm up by 7 a.m. every day trying to negotiate a complicated app with 50,000 other guests in order to get a spot on a particular ride. So there's someone who's not worried about extra costs, but it's, you know, the next person on here, my concern is the same issues with fast pass will still exist. For example, we would book three fast passes, but no guarantee that more slots would be available. Will this be the same with Genie Plus? One ride, then potluck after that. Secondly, how long would we wait between reservations? If I end with only three reservations because of business, the, uh, business at the park, then I do not appreciate having to pay something and nothing extra in the previous free service. And, you know, people, no, this is so disappointing. Super disappointed at Disney Parks are taking away the much-loved and used fast pass program. A lot of different things. Disappointed. As I see the word disappointed on here a lot. Uh, and one person even said the frustration of mandatory fast food ordering by smartphone are the excessive wait times or the excessive wait. Or I guess it says as are the excessive wait times when you suddenly desire beverage now. A Disneyland mint julep has required an hour wait with the digital queue on a hot afternoon. Don't forget to bring me an extra battery for your smartphone. So, oh, but there's one person says, I recognize I'm in the minority here, but personally, I love this. So, I mean, uh, there's some people have been very upset about this. And some of the defense I've seen on Facebook of this program has been people saying, oh, well, you know, the, the price you pay, you know, is it's worth it for all the stuff. And if you just don't like it, just don't come to the parks. Well, here's the thing. At this point, most people in the world, I'd venture to say, will either never manage to get to a park or are only going to go once in their life. It'll be a once-in-a-lifetime trip. Now, here's why I say this. I've only been able to go once, and I can't afford to go. If I had a family of more than it was just my wife and I, I mean, you know, say you say you've got even just two kids. There's four of you. I mean, the park tickets alone are getting extremely expensive. And now they're finding ways to add extra fees for you to really be able to enjoy your trip. It's going to cost you even more. Once in a lifetime trip, if you can ever afford to go. And the only people I see really defending this are people who, what I call Disney privileged. These are the people who can manage to go 
every year, sometimes more than once. These are the same people who can take a photo every time they go to Disney Park. They take a picture and they'll say, I'm home. Because they're frequent park visitors. And these people apparently have the money to be able to go. They don't, of course, they're not going to have a problem with this. Like they have, they can afford to keep going. But most people can't do that. It might be a once in a lifetime trip, but you're, you might be aiming for that once in a lifetime trip, but it keeps getting more expensive. It's like being on the playground saying, all right, I want to come and play the play basketball or something. And someone keeps pulling the ball further away from you to where you can't get to the ball. You want to come play, but you can't. And yet the Disney privilege, there are people who are saying, well, then just don't come. Well, we can't, we can't afford to. That's the problem. They're finding, you know, they're raising prices and finding new ways to charge money for stuff that used to not cost you anything. I mean, this is this is problems I'm having with the modern Disney park. This is one of the reasons why we've pulled away from Disney quite a bit here on this show. I don't think this is the way Walt meant it to be. Well, you know, Walt was just charging you to go on rides, and it might have been, at the time, not mildly expensive to get on a ride, but I don't think it was like this. And this reminds me of a, a bit of dialogue from Jurassic Park. Or even John Hammond is saying he wants everybody in the world to be able to come and enjoy these attractions, you know, these you know, dinosaurs and things like that. And the lawyer was talking about how they can just charge anything they want and people will pay it. <laughs> and then when John Hammond said, mentions like, he wants everybody to be able to come and enjoy this, the lawyer says, oh, well, we'll have coupon day or something. Uh, this, this has become the park that it's not catering to most people. It is for people who... You know, really, and they've been, you know, that's yeah, that's what a business is for, to be able to make money. I understand that. But this might be getting a little bit ridiculous. They're almost going too far to where people can't afford to come. But, you know, they're they're still going to make money. It's like, yeah, because the people who can't afford will go and go as much as they want because, hey, the park's not going to be crowded. Uh, you know, that seems to be the goal. I don't know. Just like less people able to come and experience the magic of these Disney parks. I don't know, something just seems not right about this whole thing. But I do want to move on. Uh, I do want to visit the trailer park before I, I don't want to make this a whole you know show of complaining about stuff, but something is just off about this whole thing. Anyways, let's go to the trailer park. Mama, now the gator got in the house. Now the gator? Give me that sugar. Come here. Oh. Get him, Mama. Oh. Get that gator. Ah. Ew. Ah. The Neverland Trailer Park. Five years ago, Thanos erased half of the population of the universe. But the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. The sudden return of the population provided the necessary energy for the emergence to begin. do we have seven days we're eternals we came here seven thousand years ago to protect humans from the deviants why didn't you guys help fight thanos or any war, or all the other terrible things throughout history. We were instructed not to interfere in any human conflicts unless deviants are involved. By who? We need to find the others. I haven't seen some of them for centuries. I... Hello. This is what the end of the world looks like. At least we have front row seats. You know what's never saved the planet? Your sarcasm. We have loved these people since the day we arrived. When you love something, you protect it. You 
you can't protect. Any of them. Perfect safe house. Well, what's this even made of? Vibranium? Fall collection. Ikea. Marvel Studios Eternals. Now, I'm not a bit familiar with the Eternals, honestly, uh, in the comic books. Uh, I'm going to have to familiarize myself a little bit more. Uh, as we get closer to the movie itself, really, because uh, I, you know, I'm going to want to cover it, of course, on the show, but I am just not that familiar with this. But this looks very, very interesting. Uh, it's got enough vagary to me to where I don't really know what's going on because I, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not uh, knowledgeable in the Eternals, so I don't understand when I see images of the villain here they're showing. This is, you know, I when I've read Marvel. I've never really got interested in a lot of the cosmic things going on. I prefer, you know, I would read X-Men mainly and Spider-Man and some of the more um, localized type of things. I never got into the cal the galaxy hopping like Silver Surfer or, you know, anything with cosmic you know, implications. I didn't really dabble in it. So this is going to be all new territory for me. Uh, but this looks very, very interesting. They show at least a little bit of humor at the end. Uh, very epic in scale. Uh, we're looking at this movie coming out November 5th. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to checking out. This will be a definitely a new experience for me. Uh, but we also had a television trailer this week. With that sword, Grayskull will soon be ours. Do halt! Bring the sword to the champion. Champion. By the power of Grayskull, I have the power? I have the power! What did it feel like? You turned into a big ol' He-Man! Were you still you on the inside? Would you look like him on the outside? Or was he the same on the outside as he was on the inside, and you were somewhere else entirely? Ow! That's a lot of questions. The Master's nemesis have arrived. The power of Grayskull is a lie. Who's there? Why, Adam? Don't you recognize your Uncle Keldor? This is our fight, too. I'm at least the master of technology? Master of Magic. Master of the Wild. Master of Demolition. Ah! Apologies, this is all just very exciting. Like a story of old. By the power of Grayskull! We are the power! Saving Eternia is up to us. Rise, my dark masters, and wreak havoc! To know oneself is to truly become a master of the universe. A master of the what now? Behind this gate lies great power. We must approach with caution. Adam! Wait up! Wait up! <sighs> so, coming to Netflix, September 16, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Yeah, I know, it doesn't sound like it, but that's what it would be. Uh, this is aimed at kids. The interesting thing is when you look at uh, where this trailer is hosted, 16,000 dislikes, 6,000 6 likes. So you have 10,000 more dislikes than you have likes. And comments 
are turned off. That is never a good sign. That means reactions to this trailer have not been good. And I can't say that my reaction to that trailer is all that good. This looks more like, you know, there's very much modern cities and looks like they're trying to go more of a future in technology and losing some of the fantasy and magic of what makes Masters of the Universe a great mix of fantasy with some technology, kind of like Star Wars was. It's really seemed to be lacking a lot of that. And a lot of people are kind of wondering, like, hey, how come Ram Man became Ram Ma'am? <laughs> because, yeah, they seem to have gender swapped Ram Man. Uh, and But the design, of, I'm not really a fan of the designs, the redesigns of all the characters uh, and the style of this. And you heard there was a bit of a, sort of a rap music feel to it. So this just doesn't feel like Masters of the Universe. And yes, I know we're going to there. A lot of people are going to say, well, it's not aimed for you. It's aimed for the kids. But you know what? I think if I had kids, I would rather sit them down with the filmation or maybe even Revelation. I probably would, might show them that series if they were old enough, because I mean, there was some blood in, in Masters of the Universe Revelation. But I would probably show them the filmation. I would even show them the Mike Young series if I had access to it. This one, I, I this one looks like a bit of an embarrassment, but we'll see what happens when it comes out. And if they manage to sell toys for this, because, you know, that's that's the measurement for these things usually is if it sells toys. I just don't see this selling very many toys. Uh, I mean, it could. I mean, kids might just jump all over and love this, but uh, I don't I don't know. <laughs> we'll see because it's really it really is aimed at the kids. But oh boy. Now, this next thing. uh Scott kind of got a surprise for Spider-Man No Way Home that a trailer had been leaked. People have been expecting a trailer for this because the movie's supposed to come out in December. And people have been asking, well, where's the trailer? We thought we'd get one with Black Widow and we didn't see one. And so somebody leaked some footage and the, the, the leaked footage was a little longer than what the trailer that was released uh, on Monday. And I think it's because there's a lot of unfinished effects and footage. So I think they were working on a bigger trailer. And they were get, trying to get the effects together, but then when that leak happened, everybody acknowledged, and so, well, you know, over Marvel Studios, Sony Entertainment, something like that, and they said, well, I guess we better just go ahead and put something out now. So they put together what they could get final shots on, what the effects were that, done, and so they released this trailer right here. Look at this. This is a good one. Some suggest that Parker's powers include the male spider's ability to hypnotize females. Stop. Come on. <laughs> yes, my spider lord. <laughs> Can we just, like, stay up here all day? It is so crazy down there. That's right, folks. Spider-Man is, in fact, Peter Parker. Listen, I did not kill Mysterio. The drones did. The drones that are yours. Does any part of you feel relieved about all this? What do you mean? Now that everybody knows, you don't really have to hide or lie to people. For the record, I never wanted to lie to you. But how do you tell someone that you're Spider-Man? Now everybody knows. But this isn't about me. This is hurting a lot of people. I've just been thinking about how to fix all of this. So, Peter. To what do I owe the pleasure? I'm sorry to bother you, sir. Please, we saved half the universe together. I think we're beyond you calling me, sir. Okay, Steven. That feels weird, but I'll allow it. When Mysterio revealed my identity, my entire life got screwed up. I was wondering if maybe you could make it so that he never did. Strange. Don't cast that spell. It's too dangerous. Fine, I won't. The entire world is about to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Wait, everyone? Can't some people still know? That's not how the spell works. So MJ's gonna forget about everything we've ever been through? Stop tampering with the spell. Oh my god, Ned, he's my best friend. Oh, my Aunt May should really stop talking. <laughs> what just happened? tampered with the stability of space-time. The multiverse is a concept about which we know frighteningly little. The problem is you trying to live two different lives. The longer you do it, the more dangerous it becomes. Be careful. 
not what you wish for, Parker. Hello, Peter. All right, December 17th, Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, if you haven't seen this, maybe you recognize a few voices, right? Maybe. Uh, we did hear Willem Dafoe laughing as a goblin uh, pumpkin bomb rolls on screen and detonates. Also, we see some Doc Ock arms come in, and Alfred Molina is the one you're hearing there saying, Hello, Peter. So what we kind of got from the leaked teaser was that we've got possibly a Sinister Six coming with bringing in villains because of this multiverse concept from previous Spider-Man movies throughout this franchise since like, you know, 2002 when the first film came out. And I there's been still showing like, a, oh, uh, Jamie Foxx. Uh, you know, the lizard, I mean, maybe we'll get Sandman, maybe Michael Keaton's even coming back to be a vulture. We, we shouldn't hit an entire Sinister Six, especially if that spell makes people forget who they are. Remember the vulture had found out that Peter was Spider-Man and kind of thought, you know, he's not such a bad guy and he was kind of going to leave him alone. But if you take maybe that knowledge away from the vulture, he could be evil again. So, I mean, and my wife even asked about Sandman. I said, well, Sandman was uh, an original part of the Sinister Six, but of course in Spider-Man three, uh, we did see Sandman having some, um, some remorse over what he had become, right? And, and and being evil. So I don't know, but still, maybe Sandman, you know, there's a lot of, there's a whole lot of villains that could be coming back for this, uh, but apparently for a Sinister Six, which is what Sony has wanted uh, since Amazing Spider-Man 2 had come out, you know, they were, they were leaning towards getting Sinister Six together. And this gave him an opportunity, thanks to the multiverse, to do something like that. And I like the way, as a nod to the comics, when we had, uh, you know, Spider-Man had revealed himself during the Civil War in the comics to be Peter Parker because he was trying to be on the right side of things. He revealed himself. But uh, when it became dangerous to Aunt May uh, and stuff like that, he had. He had went to Doctor Strange. I mean, there, that's a lot of different things, but he had went to Doctor Strange to make everybody forget unless he told them who he was. And then they would remember all the things they knew about him. They would suddenly remember if he told them who he was or revealed himself. But he made everybody forget. Who he was. And also ended up making this other thing where he made a deal with Mephisto where Mephisto took away the marriage between him and Mary Jane in order to uh, save Aunt May's life. I mean, there's a lot of complicated stuff that they've kind of had to work around and kind of fix because they really made some a mess of things. Uh, I really didn't enjoy a lot of that. And I think uh, that might have happened even during uh, our time here in Neverland way back since 2013. I don't know because I, I know I've brought this up before that was one of the things I really didn't like about some of the Spider-Man comics was when they did all that was... Didn't like it. I, I, anyway, even though they, there were some pretty good comics that came in, some pretty good stories, but uh, the massive change really was, you know, uh, it wasn't enjoyable. And so they have since then brought Mary Jane back and they have fixed a lot of that, uh, those problems that were created by doing that. But anyways, that's neither here nor there, nor there, but oh my goodness. So part of what we were teased at with is also the return of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield as other Spider-Man that from a multiverse concept and I almost even would wonder if we might see a Miles Morales appearance. Who knows? Just for fun. Could, it could happen. But this is being directed by John Watts, written by Chris McKinnon, Eric Summers. And of course, we've gotten the cast Tom Holland, Zendaya, Benedict Cumberbatch, John Favreau, Jacob Batalon with Marissa Tomei. Everybody is coming back. And holy cow, I, I'm really glad they went ahead and released this uh, this like three minute, well, just under three minute trailer after they really didn't have a choice because it got leaked. Uh, so I, I don't think we're going to get any additional footage later, even though it looks like they were planning on a lot of different shots. But like I said, if you look and where the original teaser thing had been released by somebody, it looked like a tablet with a phone filming the tablet. I mean, it was on top of another thing. It's really not good footage, but you could see there was a lot of unfinished shots and the effects that uh, were still being worked on with the, with what was leaked. So they put together, like I said, this trailer appears to have everything that they do have kind of completed. Uh, and we're just going to have to wait until December before we see anything else when the movie comes out. But it did its job. Everybody's super excited with what we've learned, especially with no one 
that it seems we're connecting some of the classic Spider-Man, which we've kind of thought about before when there was a teaser a long time ago for No Way Home and people had noticed on the wall that there seemed to be a Tobey Maguire Spider-Man picture on the wall and, and a shot. Uh, or was that one of the Venom movies? I don't know, but it, it was like it's there. And I wonder if at some point Sony's going to try to connect this back in with the Venom films. I don't know. I, I haven't watched uh, the first one. And, you know, the second one, I'm, you know, it's Carnage. I'm kind of curious to watch it, but I don't like Venom being pulled away from the Spider-Man universe like that. I, you know, I like, I like the Venom's story is really good. The Venom versus Spider-Man story, if done properly, could be really excellent. Uh, but, you know, I might just have to go and sit and watch Venom just for just to catch up on it because it might be. Might be part of the connection. Who knows? And, but, you know, with this concept of multiverse, this could be the way to bring in the Fox's version of X-Men into the uh, the Marvel Universe. So uh, who knows where this leads? This, I mean, they have set a precedent here of being able to combine the franchise past movies together. This would be like the current DCEU finding a way to bring Tim Burton's Batman, you know, back uh, along with even, you know, the... Uh, the Dark Knight trilogy version of Batman. Who knows? Uh, that would be kind of cool, but I don't know if DC is going to do anything like that. And plus, it would seem like copycat <laughs> after Marvel's pulling this. All right, but before we get into our guests, you know, I, I found some audio for you I think you might want to check out. At the far end of the universe, there is a planet ruled by a being of utter evil. <laughs> And there is only one man who dares challenge him. They are locked in a battle to the death. A battle that will take them across the heavens. Stop him! A battle that will finally be fought. I want them to get down and brought to me! Across the face. Police! Nobody move! Of Earth. I think I'm gonna need some backup. Can you show us the way? Of course. No. Somebody help me! No! Julie! From a distant galaxy, they have come to Earth. Dolph Lundgren as He-Man, Frank Langella as Skeletor. Only they have the powers to be. Masters of the universe, live the adventure. All right, we have with us Gary Goddard. He has produced, directed, and designed some of the world's biggest theme park attractions, including Jurassic Park The Ride, Terminator 2 3D, Battle Across Time, Star Trek The Experience, Fantasia Lagoon, Jaws, King Kong on the Loose, The Amazing Adventure... Well, I said that really weird. The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man, James Bond 007 License the Thrill, Six Flags Monster Mansion, The Mask of Spain's Movie World, Sanrio Japan, Eminem Academy, Caesar's Magical Empire, and Conan and the Ghostbusters live stage shows over at Universal. That's just a few of the things he's done. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about some of the stuff, some of these projects. I kind of got started with one project, but I was like, oh my gosh, look at all this other stuff. Uh, so everybody, please welcome Gary Goddard. Yay. Hello. Hey, hey, how, how are you? I am doing great. Uh, I've been. I just to saw my life. I just saw my laugh fla flashing before my eyes there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a long list of accomplishments, and I was like, "Wow, I should narrow this down a little bit." Because uh, I don't even remember how I found you first on Facebook, but uh, but you were sharing because we we're this is the 35th anniversary of the 1987 Masters of the Universe, and you were sharing all these images of, of the sets. So I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is so awesome!" So <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I need to talk to this guy, especially I was like, oh, yeah, I think I was following him because you were at one point an Imagineer with Disney and yep. so much stuff. But uh, I want to go back is you studied at CalArts. And the fun thing about CalArts is you know, like uh, when I've talked to Mike Parasa, he's got photos of his class. And, you know, he's got photos with Tim Burton and so many different people that went through CalArts. Who did you go to class with? Uh, well, I was in the first official graduating class. I was there the first year I graduated from high school, the first year that CalArts uh was CalArts. We were on a temporary campus in uh, Burbank, the Villa Cabrini campus, an old nunnery, actually, wow. because the campus in Valencia was behind schedule and wasn't finished yet. So uh, 
But I guess uh, David Hasselhoff, uh, Ed Harris, uh, Michael Pressman, um, yeah, a whole host of people that went on as actors, directors, writers. Yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting times there. That was, you know, uh, that was a very radical school, especially when it started out. Yeah. <laughs> All these super creatives just kind of went through and it's, it's almost like guaranteed success. If you come through Cal Arts, you're going to succeed at whatever you're doing. Well, I, it was it was good for me. It was definitely definitely uh, um, the big jump from Santa Barbara down to Los Angeles, and so that was yeah, it was great. So, what was your overall goal when you went to Cal Arts? Did you want to mainly design rides, or were you always looking at directing films? No, really, I was uh, seeing. I, I acted in a lot of shows, and I directed a few shows, but in high school, and wrote written my own musicals in high school and staged them. But I and I also made a sixteen millimeter color sound film in my senior year. Uh, with Timothy Bottoms, who I went to school with, you know, the Tim Bottoms and Joe Bottoms, the Bottoms acting family. Mm. Uh, Tim did Johnny Got His Gun. And then he got then he did the Paper Chase movie. And uh, yeah, he did a ton of movies. And then Joe did the Black Hole for Disney. And he did um, the Holocaust miniseries on TV. Mm. Uh, Sam Bottoms worked with with Bogdanovich and then with Clint Eastwood and a lot of pictures. Um, they were all Santa Barbara. We all went to school together. And, and so um, it was an interesting time. Uh, I was interesting because by the time I heard about uh, uh, Cal Arts, I was in my senior year. It's interesting. I did not take the proper uh, classes from high school to go into college because I had no intention of going to college. I was gonna, I was gonna get cast in a show. This is my great idea in high school. I was gonna go audition, get cast in a touring show, go see tour the country as a performer, get paid for it, and then get cast in an international show and go see the world and get paid for it. <laughs> so I didn't have to go to college. And then uh, it's a long story, but the short version is. Uh, I wound up meeting uh, one of the nine old men who had a who had a home in Santa Barbara, a second home in Santa Barbara, Les Clark, and uh, Les invited me to the studio, and I went down to the studio. I, I couldn't even drive yet, so I had to get my high school teacher to drive me to the studio. I think I was <laughs> 15 and a half or 16, and uh, so Les gave me a tour. And on the tour, they had a they had the California Institute of the Arts trailer, two trailers on the lot that were promoting Walt's greatest dream. Walt had passed away. He'd left $40 million of his estate to see California Institute of the Arts established. And this and this is where it's a big model, you know, typical of Disney. There was a model in the trailer, an artwork of what the schools were going to be. It was going to be the first community of the artists. The concept was all of the teachers and all the students would live on the campus together because Walt saw arts as a 24-hour thing. You, you know, yeah. if you work at midnight, you worked at midnight and all that kind of – and I suddenly thought, God, I really want to go here. But I told the woman who was giving me the tour, I said, well, I can't because um, I didn't take the college requirement class. And she said, well, Cal Arts is very unique. Uh, they've been accredited by the Western uh, College Association, so you still get a fully accredited degree if you finish four years. But you don't have to have – all of the minimum requirements of other colleges. You just have to audition. If you get in on your talent, you get in. So I definitely wanted to audition. But I was so late in the game, the theater school was really full. But the theater and dance school was the same school the first year. And um, and the, the the dean said, you're, you're good as an actor, but we're full. But do you dance? And I said, well, I don't really dance, but I've danced in musicals. And, and you know, I've, I've done dance. I'm not a trained dancer. Well, audition for Bella Lewitsky. She's She's low on male dancers. If you get into the dance school, you can take the theater classes because we're swapping classes. So I auditioned for the dance school and I got in so I could take my theater classes. And um, and uh, I found out why I got in. In the first year of the school, there were uh, probably 60 or 70 women dancers. There were six guys. So there obviously oh, wow. was a dearth of guys. <laughs> so uh, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel like this. But anyway, um, so then I did that. Then um, I, I decided that I didn't want to actually go on with college, but then um, I had taken a few film classes with Alexander McKendrick, who directed films like A High Wind in Jamaica, The Man in the White Suit. He was part of the whole Eaton Studios back in the days they were making all those Eaton comedies. And um, so I, I wanted to go in the film school, and they said, well, you have to audition for it. Well, I'd made a few films in high school, and I auditioned, I got into the film school. It's interesting. So then by the second year of the film school, I said, well, I'm done. I'm ready to go. I'm not going to finish college. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my thing. And then Michael Addison became dean of the theater school, and he had directed me in a production of Merchant of Venice. I was the clown. I was uh, Peter in Merchant of Venice when I was in the 10th grade, I think. And he saw my name and said, well, you should, you should, uh, you should come, come to the theater school. And I said, well, I danced the skin and I did film. I don't know. And he's, well, just come. So I thought he was inviting me in, but I still had to audition. I had to audition each time. Oh, goodness. But anyway, I got into theater school. And so and then I still felt the same way. Like, I, I want to get out in the real world. But by then, I'd done three years. So I'm going to do my fourth year and get my degree, which I did. Have I ever used my degree? Nope. 
but I got it. Uh, uh, so that's a long way of saying it. anyway that. So the interesting thing was what was interesting for me is I did learn about dance, theater and filmmaking all in those three years because the way it all happened. And I think if you look at my career, that has informed all of my work. So yeah. so I think it worked out right. <laughs> Definitely. Because uh, it looks like with uh, a lot of your your work inside some of these uh, these park attractions, you're not so much on the engineer side as you are the creative design and writing out and creating story to it. Yeah, I, I, I work on the I, I work on creating the concept and then on the writing of it and then working very closely with the designers on the design of it. I mean, the patents for the technology in T2-3D and the Spider-Man 3D-4D ride and Jurassic Park the ride all have my name on them, not because I'm an engineer, but because the idea for the key technology was mine. And, and the way patents work, when Universal wanted to get those patented, you have to include the inventor, not necessarily the engineer. He, he goes on as well. Yeah. But but so so. What, I, what, what I've been very good at is, because I, I kind of have a mind for both story and technology, is uh, finding the right technology to go with the story. And I think the difference in the way that I've always approached things is I kind of try and get the essence of the attraction concept. I want to get it to a point where I understand what is the best way to tell that that story. And then and then I, I, I look for the technology that will help tell that story, not the technology first. And then, you know, let's just fit the thing to it. <laughs> Spider-Man is the best example because the Spider-Man ride was before there were any movies, before Sam did his right. movies or anything. But, you know, Sam and I grew up reading the same the same comics, the Sinister Six. So we, so we thought awesome. of all the same villains and everything, right? So, yeah. so when it came to it, I was already working on T2 3D, Terminator 2 3D. I was working in the 3D realm for that one. And then we started working on Project X, which was going to become, you know, the Universal, uh, you know, park. And um, so at first, we it was going to be the DC superheroes. There was a whole other park with DC and Warner Brothers and Looney Tunes. Mm. Worked on that for a year and a half, and then that got shelved because Warner's and Universe can make the deal. So now we start all over now with Marvel, with uh, all the different characters, uh, Popeye, and you know, all this stuff. so, so. Uh, but what I've been saying was, as a superhero comic book fan, whatever whatever the story is, and, and uh, at the time it was going to be Superman, and then it was became Spider Man. But either way, I said, look, the the essence of a comic book is it's in your face action, and and we have to do it in a way that can do that. So if you start thinking about that, that you want this to be in your face, and it's got to be a ride. Well, there's only one way to do a ride that can be in your face is with 3D, and that had never been done before. So everyone's like, well, that's going to work. I said, no, it'll work. Don't worry. And and uh, and, and the reason to do that is in a ride, you have a six foot envelope from the from the arm of the person on the left side to the arm of the person on the right side. You can't have anything that they could get hurt doing. Same thing on the top. You know, you, you gotta have this envelope. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you want to get in the face of the rider, it has to be 3D. It's the only way you can do it because there's nothing physical in the way of the ride system. No one can get hurt. So I started working on this idea for a 3D ride, 3D, 4D. Um, yeah, and and that's how we took off on that. Uh, basically, on both T2, 3D, and on um, the Spider-Man ride, I was actually fought every step of the way. I was never an internal uh, designer for uh, Universal. I was always outside Universal, and so the the internal Universal team uh, were always kind of anti Gary to some degree. But, uh, but luckily, the top executive Jay Stein uh, believed in me, and as long as I could continue to prove my ideas would work, he supported them. And uh, but otherwise, if it wasn't for Jay Stein, there would never been a T2 3D and there never would have been a Spider-Man 3D 4D ride. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. But there's too much uh, blocking of it. Yeah. Ultimately, all those people still take credit for it now for both of those because they're very successful. But, you know, that's how it is. Yeah. Henry Gluck, who was the chairman of Caesars Palace when we did the forum shops, everyone was against the forum. All my best things. Everyone thought would fail. All the experts thought would fail. The forum shops, retail in the Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, everyone said, that'll never work. Retail doesn't work in Las Vegas. That's not even a mall. You're doing some kind of weird Roman thing. <laughs> but uh, when it worked, everybody took credit for it. And Henry said at the time, you know, Gary, success have a, has a thousand fathers. Failure is a bastard. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it's true. Anyway, uh, that's a long way of saying that um, I, from my standpoint, um, I feel you have to get to the essence. The, the, what, what is the spine of the particular IP that you're doing, the, the, the story you're telling, the medium? And, and what is the right technology in a theme park to tell that story? 
Uh, so, uh, like for instance, I wasn't crazy about the first Harry Potter ride and they, they didn't want to do 3d 40 on that because they had it on Spider-Man. Mm. Uh, but I, w- I was kind of phased out on my universal phase, but I didn't say, well guys, but it is the right technology for that. It's all about magical blasts and beams and transformations. And that, yeah. I mean, it's the right technology. And I still feel to this day that that first ride of, 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 uh, of the Harry Potter thing, you know, and that's another, that's another example. They fell in love with the robo arm technology for a ride. And back when you're going to sit on a broom and you're actually going to be on the broom, that might have had some valid. But then by the time they got into capacity issues, they had to get three people per thing. So that became a bench. Now it's a flying bench, not a flying broom. Yeah. But you're following, you know, it, it just get it, it morphs into something else that, that it really wasn't the idea. But uh, anyway, I guess I got a sidetrack there. But uh, you asked. So now you- <laughs> That's all right. We like chasing rabbits around here. <laughs> Especially because I love, you know, talking the Spider-Man ride. I have I'm the, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, uh, which I guess it's not completely obvious from everything behind me. But uh, I've got Spider-Man stuff over on this side of the desk that you just can't see, including my uh, my Stan Lee figure, of course, that a friend cool. of mine got me for my birthday. So, yes, uh, I've seen footage of the Spider-Man ride and like the original version. It's it's almost like somebody just put you right in the middle of the 90s animated series, which is one of the best versions of Spider-Man is that 90s animated series. I just loved that. I absolutely adored it, and uh, yeah, the only, yeah. only thing that's come close to that is, is Sam Raimi's version of Spider-Man. Those those first two mil- films he did were just phenomenal. I love. Well, the death. original the original villains in uh, the Spider-Man ride were the Sinister Six. Right. It was the, it was it was the Sandman, and then Jay didn't want the Sandman. He Sandman. I said the Sandman is perfect for 3D. He 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 collapses and reforms as yeah. whatever. He can come right at you and say, but I couldn't. Say, and then I had the lizard underneath the pier. And then they wanted no. We want to, We want this water aqua creature that you know. Hydro man. But yeah. originally it was it was the Sinister Six. Now they kept yeah. Electro and Doc Ock and you know you know and uh, so it, it turned out well anyway. Yeah. And I, I really liked it. And but uh, it's interesting. Had they kept all? I also had Mysterio. Mysterio was oh, in there. Neat. So had they kept? Because remember he was one of the Sinister Six. Yeah. If they kept the Sinister Six. That movie would be right in tune with all of the movies that have been made because they've used all those villains now. Yeah. You know. Anyway, yeah, yeah some of, there were some of his best villains. Yeah, really. It's still I even uh, I wish I had the original Sinister Six, but I do have like the Revenge of the Sinister Six, which was a little different. I think I think Craven the Hunter was brought in for like a second wave of it. And I had all of those, but I sold them about five years ago. But I oh, did man. keep but I did keep this. Nice. Very cool. <laughs> that's the original. That's the one I bought when I was like, wow. 10 years old, you know, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I oh couldn't park goodness. with that, but I was like, I'm keeping this. I yeah. kept a few others, but I, I never kept that. Yeah, I'm I'm just kind of hoping some stuff I've kept is still going to be like valuable. If, I had Amazing I had Fantasy 15. I had Amazing oh. Fantasy 15. And look, I th- you'll love this. Wait, I'll show you. You'd have to be a, uh, you know, practically no one at Universal even understood this, but any fan would know why this is the concept, the first concept book for Spider-Man ride. Wow. What did I use for the cover? Of course. Oh, that is fantastic. I used the cover, but it says, heads up, heroes. It's my very own 3D ride at Universal. Oh, wow. Get ready for the fight of the century. It's Spidey versus the Sinister Six. See? Oh, that is so, so cool. You, know, you have to be a fan to even understand this. But that's the other yes. thing I do. When, when, when we do T2 and we do Spider-Man, it's interesting. For a theme park, you have to do the ride so that if anyone comes in and doesn't know anything about the mythology – in the queue and the pre-show, you can bring them into it. Yeah. But then you want to do another layer for the fans. So when they go through the ride, they know whoever did this gets it that, you know, that, that, that I get it. I love it too. So, so the trick is, and T2 and Spider-Man, all these things work that way. If you don't know the mythology, you can still enjoy it. Mm -hmm. If you do know the mythology, you know, the guys behind it know it as well and have applied themselves to it, you know? So, that's important to me that whatever we do is 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 in the spirit of um, the the characters, the mythology, the story uh, that 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 we're telling about that particular character, that particular world, whatever it is. Yeah, and really to bring the writer into it, and you get to be a part of the story. That's one of the things that makes Disney rides just the best. Is suddenly I'm in the story, I'm a part of this whole thing, and oh my goodness, I'd probably. If I ever get a chance to write that Spider-Man right, even though they've they've kind of spruced it up here over the what like five no, years no, ago. No, no, the, the main thing still. they did is they improved the they went digital with the projectors, yeah. which is better. 
a much, much, much yeah. brighter, clearer picture. Yeah, so it's a little different, but it's still, I mean, if I, I might I might have tears in my eyes when I get off the ride, like, I've been in there. So, yeah. <laughs> I'd try Turned crying out. the E.T. ride, though, too, because, I mean, E.T. always makes me cry anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> but uh, let's dive into some movie. Uh, heck, I even got to dive into some TV. But so Masters in the Universe, you're credited as a writer, producer, and and the director on that. Uh, director, uh, mainly the director. Uh, I did wind up uh, rewriting the script, but uncredited. uncredited. Um, David Odell wrote the script, but uh, between Frank Langella and I, we we were we were really writing a lot of it, uh, rewriting a lot of it as we went. Uh, and uh, so everything that you see, especially the third act, the uh, the Air Centurions, the big the big ship that comes in, the the Gothic you know ship that Skeletor mm-hmm. rides, the Air, Air Centurions, the transformation to God, I mean, all that stuff. I added uh, because there really was very little of Eternia in the original script, mm-hmm. very little. And um, I felt we needed to get Eternia in there. And uh, uh, so I came up with this idea of bookending the movie with Eternia by using the throw room. I, you remember, it was a very low budget uh, at the time. Uh, a typical action film like Indiana Jones, those kind of things were in, between 35 and $50 million. We had $17 million, um, to make this. So, wow. But I convinced uh, Menahem, uh, you know, Golan Globus, that if we built a big set, uh, I came up with this concept that we'd book in with the big throne room, with the, you know, uh, it's Eternian throne room. Mm-hmm. And um, and I said, we'll shoot about half the movie there, as it turns out. We'll shoot about the first 10, 15 minutes there, and we'll shoot the last 20 or 30 minutes there. And we're on a soundstage. It's controlled. There's no weather problems. You're not going to have delays. You know, when you're, when you're on locations, anything can happen. The idea of being on a control soundstage for that much of the film, they bought it. They were like, okay, (laughs) we'll spend a lot of money on it, but we know every day we can shoot. Doesn't matter if it's raining, doesn't matter what it is, you know, we'll shoot. So that's how I had to have a practical reason to build that set. Uh, But they they bought it. And that gave me storytelling wise, we begin in Eternia and we end in Eternia. So, you know. That that was that that was how that came about. Yeah. Heck, you could have spent the whole movie on an attorney, and I think everybody would be even happier. Yeah, well that but that the script came to me. Ed Pressman already had the star, Dolph mm-hmm. Lundgren, and he already had a script by David Odell. And in that script, it started with the Courtney Cox's character in the kitchen of her uh, house, and there's a pounding on the door, and she opens it, and this muscle bound guy in, you know, in a loincloth collapses there, he obviously having been through some kind of battle. That's He Man. Mm. So I mean, it really started right there in you know in, in, in here in Earth. So I, I didn't think that that was epic enough. That doesn't. No that's not the way you start a He Man picture, you know. No kidding. <laughs> that would have been like, uh, why are we on Earth? So yeah. And it was an adjustment, I think, for me as a kid because you know, you get so used to the cartoon. And I was, uh, let's see, in '87, I was probably about well. 10 years old, but I probably didn't see it until like 88 when it was on VHS. So I was like 11 years old. And for some reason, your brain as a kid thinks you're going to see the cartoon brought to life, but you actually got brought like a, a different take of everything. Uh, Cause we didn't have any Prince Adam mention at all. Uh, we did have a nice, I have the power moment there. That was, that was probably the most epic part. Other than Frank Langella's performance, the Skeletor was just yeah. brilliant. Oh my goodness. He just went for it. Now that's, that's something with, with a property like masters of the universe, you'd really have to go all in. Cause otherwise it's, no one's going to believe it because it's it's yeah. not so fantastical. Uh, but really, you had a pretty good cast. And uh, we got the world has to thank you for introducing us to Courtney Cox as a guy who's <laughs> been watching Friends marathoning all this week on, on HBO Plus. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yep. But uh, yep. when you got into the project, were you how familiar were you with the property? I, I don't know if you had any kids at the time that were into the toys or anything like that. No, no, I was. Uh, what was I? Thirty four. I think I, I think. Um, uh, well, I was aware of the line, not as much of the show. I'd seen a few episodes, but I hadn't watched all the episodes, but I was certainly aware of the phenomenon of, of Master the Universe. But I was working with Mattel as a consultant on some of their toy lines. And so they knew me and I knew them. And that wound up being an important thing because Ed Pressman, he, he made a deal with Mattel for the rights to make a movie, but they had the rights. They had the approvals on the star, Dolph, the script, they'd approved it, and on the director. And when I met Ed Pressman, I had done the Conan show at Universal, which is, you know, a sword and sorcery kind of spectacular kind of thing. And um, I basically called him and said, I, I understand you're looking for a director. I, I, I can do this. And we met and he was impressed. And I said, why don't you go see the Conan show? And, and so he and the writer, David, went to see the Conan show at Universal. And they called me afterwards and said, you're right. You, you can direct this. But there's one other thing. 
Um, and it may be a problem because you haven't really directed a film before, but Mattel has to, uh, they have an approval. I'm not sure they'll approve you. And I laughed. I said, well, I, I actually think they will approve me. And he says, why do you say that? And I told him, I said, I'm doing all kinds of work with them. And the primary reason they probably want approval is to make sure that whoever they give the movie will be sensitive to their IP mm -hmm. and not do things with that character that they won't like. And they will have confidence in me that I won't do that. And, and of course they were right and they did approve me and that's how I got it. Because everyone's like, how did you get a $17 million movie for your first movie? You know, so um, it doesn't usually happen that way. You'd usually do a, back in those days, a half a million to a million dollar movie and then a two or $3 million movie and you know, you like that. So anyway, uh, that's how it, it, it came about. And um, uh, I think that uh, I, I did the best anyone could do, given a lot of, of the difficult circumstances in that project. But the fish in the water story had already that was set. You know, for 17 million, you could not go to attorney. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the problem. You would have needed double that budget at least to do that. And then the decision I made was, uh, you know, we're not saying I've always had to explain this to fans back in the day. We're not saying Orco doesn't exist, that Battle Cat doesn't exist. And the Prince Adam doesn't exist. But when you think about it, there's no need for him to be Prince Adam on, on Earth. OK, right. there's, just, there's no need for it. And we just couldn't have done Battle Cat or Orko justice with right. the technology. There was no CG. It would either have been a, a little person on wires or it would have been stop motion Harryhausen type stuff. Same thing for Battle Cat. And <clears throat> that would have created huge problems for us in terms of our schedule and budget. Because all of that would have been done against green screen then in those days, all those sequences involved them. And I just said, we're not saying those characters don't exist on attorney. We're just saying that that that, you know, that 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 cosmic doorway opened up. And these are only the characters that got through. And of course, we created Gwildor mm -hmm. to be a stand in for Orko, you know. And he was a little I mean, Billy Barty. How, how do you not love Billy Barty in any character he played? Yeah, he was He's great. great. Even okay. even outside of makeup, you know, <laughs> which he didn't really get to do often. Usually, Billy Barty was always caked and stuff. But yeah, he just had such a charm to him that I mean, yeah. whoever's idea was to cast him as Wildor was just thank you very much. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty. Yay! Guess yeah. I mean, he just I, I just I don't know after like Willow and but yeah, Billy yeah. Barty. We just I I we love him almost as me as we love Willow. Uh, or um, wow, forgot his name altogether. Would you have thought? Who'd have thought? In Willow? Uh, yeah, the guy who played Willow, you know, uh, Warwick Davis. I think Warwick, Billy Barty yeah. is almost as beloved, if not more, than Warwick Davis, in my opinion. I don't know. Yep. For for little people actors, they're just... And that's, I think, what made Willow great, is them having scenes together, because they're just great actors. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. Anyways, yeah, I could chase a rabbit on that one, too. <laughs> so, uh, how much did you get to be in some of the design for, like, the costuming? I mean, did you get, like, approval for what... What was He-Man's armor going to look like? What was the uh, the power sword going to look like? What was Skeletor going to look like? Which was probably one of the best costume designs of bringing a toy to life. Skeletor's outfit was just awesome. Yeah, well, I worked very closely with Bill Stout. Bill Stout was a great comic, is and was a comic book artist, a great one. Um, dinosaurs, comic books, he, he's done everything. And Bill, I brought Bill on as a concept artist. And uh, about four or five weeks into the picture, I realized two things. The production designer didn't really get it. He was doing all this weird kind of postmodern, strange stuff. And, uh, and the costume designer who had previously done a lot of teen movies. So she's really good at gathering up stuff for teen comedies and stuff or anything, but creating a world is different. Mm -hmm. So I had a difficult decision to make the production designer at one point, the production had made it easy because, uh, he blew up in one meeting and says, I hate all this comic book stuff. I hate this stuff. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the guy for it. I said, okay, I agree. And so we <laughs> yeah. finished him. And because um, everything was a fight, and you know he's one of those people who looks down on comic books. He looks down on it, so he's the wrong designer. Um, the costume designer wanted to do a good job, but she would bring in really weird things for Skeletor. You know, she'd bring in like strange necklaces with teeth and stuff. You know, she's just you know. And Bill, Bill and I, we had we we got along so well because we read the same comics. We have our own shorthand, Mobius, Jack Kirby, you know, Sid Mead. We we know the same work. We, so I can go, you know, this would be like a Jack Kirby thing. This would be blah, 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 you know. So what happened was Bill Stout, as as Ralph McQuarrie was for Star Wars, he didn't get credit as the production designer or the costume designer. But when you look at all Ralph McQuarrie's work, it's all his designs. Mm -hmm. 
other people executed them. So in this case, it's the same thing. Bill really designed the costumes, uh, working with me, and the sets, working with me. And then the other people executed them. And so uh, Julie did execute the costumes, and uh, we had a good team to execute the sets. But Bill and I uh, really got along great. There's a, there's a bunch of stuff he did that we didn't use that you could see about, you know. But where we got to, the throne room and everything, I think it, it turned out, you know, quite great. And the costumes, I agree. But Bill was really the... The, the 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 guy behind all that. You should do a <laughs> show with Bill. You should do a show with Bill for sure. Probably should. That's more people to track down. <laughs> okay, but moving on from that, the next thing that that I have to dive into because uh, I actually remember watching TV. I think it was on a weekday. It was during the summer, and some ad comes on, and it's some woman who she comes up and she's like to sell stuff, and all of a sudden, like the screen just goes eh, eh, like like something's interfering. And there's this guy in this like metal helmet and everything says, so, like, hey, we, we've called you for help and everything. It was the first ad for Captain Par- Captain Power, the toy line, which I mean, it was amazing idea when you're a kid to think, oh, my gosh, this interacts with the television. And then I think maybe it was that fall that the television show came out, the Captain Power and the Soldiers of the Future. And you're created or I mean, you're credited with some of the creation of that and of, of like the television show. Did you get to have some input on the toys as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. We created the whole concept and brought it to Mattel. We, that was all our concept, not the technology. They, I presented them the idea of doing Captain Power as a live action show because at that time they had huge success with He-Man, but uh, filmation, you know, but everybody had followed suit now. Now there were tons of syndicated cartoon shows. And I said, well, when I was a kid, I used to watch Sky King and I used to watch uh, 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 the the, the, the story of a horse and the boy you loved and what was it? I uh, uh, can't remember anyway. A lot of live action shows. Roy mm-hmm. Rogers, you know. Oh, yes. Said, Why don't we bring back a live action show and let's do the soldiers of the future. Let's let's combine, you know, sci-fi fantasy future with military. Captain Power and the soldiers of the future. I had all the characters worked out, had everything. Pitched the whole thing. And they loved it. And they said, can you come back, you know, uh, tomorrow? And I said, yeah. Went back and they said, we have this interactive technology. Could you work this into the show? And I said, sure, we can find a way. And then what we really try to do is find a way that if you were a kid and you knew about it, you could play. But if you weren't, if you were an adult and you didn't know there was a toy, no one comes out in the beginning and goes, okay, kids, get your jet and get ready to you know, fire away. <laughs> right. Right? So so because uh, I wanted the show to stand on its own, mm-hmm. on its own merits. And um, so, yes, the answer to your question is I was very involved in everything. I created the series and uh, created the characters and uh, brought uh, – couple different artists in, um, Ed Eith and I think Neil Adams and uh, a few others to do some of the initial sketches for the thing. Um, Ed Sato, uh, who went on to Disney, and Ed Eith, who worked on Back to the Future and all kinds of other stuff thereafter. And Ed Eith actually worked on uh, Masters of the Universe, too, under Bill, I think. Nice. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that was that was kind of my baby along with Skeleton Warriors, which was later. And so M- Mattel did uh, Captain Power and uh, Playmates did uh, Skeleton Warriors and CBS aired. C- Skeleton Warriors was an animated series on Saturday mornings a couple of years after Captain Power. Uh, but Captain Power was labor of love. That was really a, a project that uh, that I really uh, created and owned and shepherded along with, with my uh, key crew at my company, the Landmark Entertainment. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a challenge. Yeah. And that was I, the first, first live action show to use CGI villains yes. <laughs> with the show. First one to try and actually uh, have an interactive element with the guys at home. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the first, you know, uh, kids sci high quality sci-fi fantasy show. So it was, it was a real, uh, challenge on many levels, especially on the, on the schedule that we had, but yeah, we did it. And a lot darker than what you would expect for like uh, we're aiming at kids. I mean, it was enough to where I think adults could have sat with their kids and then still enjoyed the show because it was it was fairly dark at times. I mean, you had a world that was kind of all it was almost like the apocalypse had happened. You have this one little ragtag group of uh, super soldiers that were going to go and trying to freedom fight their way through this. It was so cool. Yeah, well, I subscribe. You know, Walt Disney was once asked. I always remember this uh, by a reporter. He was talking. He said, "You know, you make all these children's films." And he stopped and said, "No, I don't, I don't really make children's films." He goes, "You know," I said, "No, I make films for their parents, and I put things in that I know the kids will like as well." Mm-hmm. That was Walt's secret to success. Right. He didn't make kids' movies. Now, when he died, I think a lot of his own people didn't understand that. They started making like little kid movies. But if you look back at the Absent-minded Professor and the Shaggy Dog, and you look at Twenty Thousand Leagues of the Sea. Adults love those movies mm-hmm. and kids like them. Yeah. And so I saw Captain Power that way. I was making that for parents and 
putting things in the kids would like as well. Yeah, and it's I that's one of the things is I, I keep seeing there's like always a rumor that somehow or another Captain Power is gonna come back because like the entire story wasn't ever resolved. Yeah. So we keep getting well, teased that this could come back. I'm like, oh please, please come back. I think it might. <laughs> I think it might. So finally. Everything happens in its own time. Isn't yeah. that what Skeletor says? <laughs> 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 Definitely. <laughs> All things come. To yeah. He who wants. And every time it's like, I think it's like every couple of years, I just something comes up on YouTube where like, oh, look, so I found this new logo somewhere. I, I think it's coming. I think it's coming. I'm like, oh, come on. Let's let's not try to get too excited for this. Like, oh, but, you know, it would actually make a really good feature film. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd like to see the feature, but it would also make now that streaming's in, mm. it'd be a great series now, too. Yeah. Especially now, you know, we didn't ha- we didn't. CGI was just beginning and, and those characters were CG at a time we were pushing the envelope. It took computers as big as filling rooms to do that, that stuff. Now with digital, we could really create a pretty cool world. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so did you get to have a hand in that? Uh, Cause I remember when I was a kid, I had, I got the XT seven actually out of a garage sale. I got my XT seven. It was after the uh, television series had already stopped airing, but it came, I had a video cassette and it was, mm-hmm. it's a full hand-drawn animated looking video. Cause I mean, you, you, there was a little bit of live action at the beginning and at the end, yeah. but then it's, it's supposed to, I had like, it was a training video where you're yeah. supposed to be on a training right. mission. I mean, the, the animation, was that done in Japan? I mean, the, the animation was amazing. I think, I think that was, or Korea. I can't remember one of the two. Yeah. Oh, it was brilliant. <laughs> But that was it was great because I remember when we first tried out, my dad wanted to give it a shot. And he's sitting there like, you know, trying to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> he got wiped out. He didn't finish the tape. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was like, I'll show you how it's done. So, yeah, I always managed to complete the tape. I'd stay alive. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's just a it's just a great series that needs to it really needs to come back, especially with all the all the 80s nostalgia going on right now. And even the rumors we're hearing of Mask being able to make a comeback as a feature film, which. Uh-huh. I oh that I would just go nuts for that as well, <laughs> and even with all the hit and miss we have for Master Universe coming back to theaters, that's just we're we, we're so ready for it. Oh Especially my God. how many attempts have there been? Like there's been a dozen directors and two dozen writers and four studios, and I guess no one can solve it. Yeah, you know, even Kevin Smith was was I loved the new Revelation series, but it was pretty divisive because there were some people that they they had different expectations, I guess. But I, if you look at the series itself, it's a great, and I'm really waiting for the second part. Uh, but you know, with with new toys being out on the shelves, with the origin toys, Revelation toys, and even a new toy line for Netflix has got yet another series that the that the teaser came out with, which. You know, I didn't really click with it, but it might be something the kids are really going to get into. So if you get a lot of kids excited about it and they start buying toys, then that's got to give somebody a nudge to say, hey, this is a viable property that needs a good feature film out with the technology we have right now. The amazing things you could pull would be fantastic. So now if you have the opportunity, would you like to come step in and be able to direct it again? Well, um, my idea is is to... uh to, to basically place it 20 years later from the one that we did. Mm. And I would call it masters universe. I Skeletor. And it would be, it would be Skeletor has been holed up down beneath snake mountain uh, for 20 years, building the armies, building everything. And then I would think it'd take a very Lord of the Rings kind of approach. I wouldn't do the origin story. I would, I would, I would go right into it. And, uh, and, and this time, Whereas he almost succeeded last time. Mm-hmm. This time, he's really got it wired because he's got the Snake Man. He's got he's, he's got all of his different guys and and um, and and I think uh, I think that would be a great movie. It, it would be on the, I think you, I think it should be on the scale of Lord of the Rings. Massive yeah. armies, massive stuff. He Man, um, and you would have Prince Adam now. You would have all that now. You know, but I wouldn't. I I do like George Lucas says, you know, there's a beginning and a middle and end to stories, but not always in that order. Mm-hmm. And I think you'd come crashing right into the middle of something, you know, cataclysmic and then work your way through it. And then the backstory will, will reveal itself throughout. Um, so it's very driving. And, and, and also you'd see Eternia as a world now with all these mm-hmm. different areas and lands and civilizations. Well, we always thought beast man was one of many beast men, you know, he's a, he's a beast man place. And, same thing with many of those characters. Yeah, like Stratos was, was supposed thing. to be the part of the story. You know, um, another thing you, people used to ask about is why did you create these new characters? I said, well, 
Marvel had all these rules for the regular characters. You couldn't kill any of them off. You couldn't hurt them. You couldn't do them. So um, we created, I thought Beast Man was probably one of the most well-known. Yeah. So we, Beast Man, but we did make him more like he's part of a tribal society somewhere, not just a standalone guy. And um, we created the other ones because we knew we were going to bump one of them off. But also we could have more fun with them because we didn't have to follow all the rules. You know, we did everything else. The costume for He-Man and Teal, all this stuff had to be approved by Mattel, you know. And so, but it's fine. I mean, I, I was happy with the end result. The Skeletor was a home run. They didn't have any problem with Skeletor. Yeah. And my thing with Skeletor was I wanted to take him away from being that <laughs> cartoon <laughs> guy to a really a guy you believe is lethal and, yeah. and is yeah. powerful and strong. And I like the fact that all the new versions, even the version in the cartoon show, they're really they're they're bouncing more from Frank Langella than from the original you know, um, Skeletor, which I think is good. I, yeah, I think that was yeah. fine for its time, but I think when you make a live action picture, you have to, you have to kind of, you, you have to raise it up a little, you know? Yeah. yeah. Skeletor had yep. to be scary and scary. Frank Langella just went for it. He was kind of scary. <laughs> I had to fight for him too. They didn't want to pay him. They wanted, they wanted, they said, my mom was like, why do you have to have him? He's in a mask. He's in a mask. Just have him do the voiceover. Just have someone else in the mask and then have him do the voice. I said, no, no, no. You don't understand. Frank is a stage trained actor. When he walks in a room, he walks in like a king. He carries himself like a king. Oh, yeah. You can't have some guy in a mask doing that. You have to have years of stage training. You have to have done Shakespeare. You, you, have, you have got to have known those moves. And that's what he brings. So does uh, Meg. Meg, you know, she, she'd done theater. She'd done class. You, in those kind of rules, you need people who know how to walk, who know how to carry themselves, mm -hmm. who know how to, you know, look like a king when they sit in the throne. And and that's not something you can train someone in six weeks. They they either they have that or they don't. It's a presence they carry with them. And yeah. I also wanted someone. And I told Mahan, I said, Mahan, we need someone who can act through the mask. That even though the mask is there, when I go in on him, you see. And Frank's eyes, yes. you know, it's just, you know, so because. It was a difference between paying him, I think, I don't know, three or four hundred thousand dollars. And if they just had him do a voiceover, it'd be like twenty grand, you know. And you'd pay some guy <laughs> just some guy to be there and act it all. I mean, you know. I mean, that was okay for Darth Vader, because Darth Vader, you really don't see anything. It really right. is and 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 he wanted someone that was six foot four or a six foot six, whatever David was, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was a whole different deal. But yeah. Yeah, Skeletor had really great presence. I mean, even when he's first introduced in the movie, and he's just walking down the hall. And I, I love the sound crew. Whoever came up with the sound of that, the Havoc staff, every time he'd take a step forward and slam that thing down, it just, he he took over the room as soon as he stepped in. It was fantastic. Yep. That whole entrance, coming around and then turning around and sitting down in that throne was just Frank Langella. Thank you, Frank Langella. <laughs> That was fantastic. Yeah, and, I, and, and how about that entrance? Again, oh. I wrote that whole entrance. So the whole entrance falling. The only thing I didn't get was I wanted the actual. I wanted to see the actual door close. Mm. Boom, you know, but you hear the door close, and we come in on it. We pick him up instead. But we follow him. And we follow him. And we follow him. And the camera comes in, and as he spins around, he goes. She says, "We go to her at last. Grayskull is ours." No, oh, yes. he sits around. Mine. I would have wound up watching this again. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, he goes, yeah, it's a lot of fun. He goes, Even the critics goes, hated it. It was goes, so fun. He goes, he goes on the staff. He goes, yes. mine. And you know, right then, you know, here she is. It's ours. And he goes, no, it's mine. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know who that guy is. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's fantastic stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a movie that I think, you know, maybe when your kids, we were like, you know, it's memories for us, but even as adults now, I think I can look back and see this is just a whole lot of fun. Uh, yeah. It's it's really, really enjoyable. And if, if I had kids, it was something I definitely would share with my kids. Like, you know, this is just it's a good time. And Skeletor is supposed to be scary that way. That's just perfect. So uh, really, I think in its own weird way, I mean, it's it's kind of become a cult hit and it's kind of timeless in its own weird way, even if it's very much in the 80s uh, when you get onto Earth. But yeah, it's got that's, that quality to it that uh, I think a good cult hit should have. Yeah, I, I, it's, I think it, I think it maybe has more fans today than it did when it opened. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many fans, and I've done it several of these shows now, where they've said that they now watch the show with their kids, and their yeah. kids love the show. You know, so I, I think it has, it is, it's a little bit timeless. So that's good. Yeah. I, I think it's. Well, definitely, thank you for your time here. Uh, once again, everybody, Gary Goddard. I don't have to list everything he did because we just went through a lot of it. There's a lot of other things you worked on that we could get into. Uh, you got anything big coming up? You're working on. 
Uh, there's a couple things opening. There's uh, in in uh, China this summer. There is a the going to be the largest uh, aquarium and marine research center in the world, and it's kind of interesting because it's called the. It's got a very technical name, the Chimlong Marine Life Research Center. I think uh, it's in Zhuhai, but it's by the largest builder of theme parks in China, and. He had come to me because the building is massive. It's twice the size. It's the. It's like two aircraft carriers length to length. Oh, yeah, wow. it's massive. And so we worked on a few ideas for uh, for what it might look like in terms of a building. And he and he liked what we did. He didn't like what the architect did. That's why he asked us to come in and help him out because we were working on another project room that opens two years from now. I call the uh, Forest Kingdom. And um, I had the idea. Finally, I said, "Well, let's stop thinking this is a building." What if this is for the oceans, what the Starship Enterprise is for the galaxies? Mm. So we designed this massive sub futuristic submarine-like ship that when kids see it, they'll be like, oh, my God. You know, you're, you're like you're boarding this massive craft that's designed to go to the deepest depths of the ocean. And, you know, I did the Georgia Aquarium, so I learned a lot about this. Mm. And, you know, we've only explored – less than 5% of the oceans. We've right. explored more of space than we have of the oceans. So the idea of this, I mean, it would make a great show anyway. I mean, you know, of some craft that can go deep, 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 but where no one's ever been and really, you know. But anyway, that was the idea. So when this opens, I think you'll probably read about it. That It's mm. it's pretty incredible. Uh, and so that's, that's happening. A couple of things we're working on. And yes, um, we're working on a couple potential shows that uh, hopefully will, uh, you know, make it on the air. So <laughs> when that happens, I'll let you know. Awesome. Well, thank you once again for being on our show this week. All right. Uh, take care. Thanks a lot. Well, that's going to wrap things up for us here at the fandom nexus of Neverland. And I want to say those of you who are Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Neverland podcast, I'm going to upload the video of my conversation with Gary Goddard. So you can see some of the things he was talking about that we did not say audio wise. Uh, there's basically these things that he showed me that is very, very cool. And if you're a comic book fan, you're going to love to see the things he was talking about that we didn't say exactly what it was. If you want to know what it is, you're going to have to become a Patreon supporter and come and watch the video version of the show. Also, remember that if you are a Patreon supporter, you will get your own specific audio feed that will not have the commercials in the show that you hear at the beginning and at the end of the show. Except for you will hear me, of course, talk about mypodcastreviews.com, which, if you happen to be a podcaster, is a very inexpensive way to get all the reviews from all different sites from around the world to see what your reviews are and be able to read them and share them. And I do have a link on the uh, front page of the website, neverlandpodcast.com, where you can go and check out my podcast reviews. So, with that, I'd also like to thank Karen Kennedy, Darren Wilhite, and Ricky Pope of the Christian Nerds Unite podcast for helping me out with the intro audio of the show. And of course, I invite you to come back next week or next time we have a show. Hopefully, I will have something next week. Uh, I do have some plans. I got to sort everything out. Make sure you come to Facebook and find us uh, uh, searching for Neverland Podcast. You will find uh, both our group and a fan page. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Neverland PCast. Until next time, get lost in an adventure.